Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for all these meetings. And we thank you for your word which you are sending to our hearts. We pray, Lord, that everything we're hearing will help us to be the kind of people, the kind of family, the kind of church that we ought to be in Jesus' name. We come before you tonight and we present all the families before you. We pray there will be fellowship in our families. There will be love in our families. There will be unity in our families. Hand in hand. Father, mother, brothers and sisters or the children will go hand in hand, united, walking together, living together, doing everything you want us to do together with no division, with no hatred, with no separation, but hand in hand, moving on to the place you want us to be. We pray, Lord, that you speak to every heart tonight. Make our families better. Grant us richer fellowship. In Jesus' name, we pray. Tonight, we are considering the family. We're considering fellowship and faithfulness in the family. In Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, reading from verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. In verse 28, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife, loveth himself. Chapter 6, verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. Verse 4. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. In Colossians chapter 3, reading from verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Verse 23. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily, as to the Lord, and not unto men. First Peter chapter 3, verse 7. First Peter 3, 7. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife, as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Tonight, as I told you, and as you can see in the 
program itself. We're talking about the family. The family is so important that we cannot have a conference like this or a congress like this without talking about the family. Because the stage of the family will be reflected in the church. If our families are healthy, then the church will be healthy. If our families are strong, then the church will be strong. But if the families are weak, then the church is going to be weak. Because the spiritual level of the church will never rise beyond the spiritual level, the love, the harmony, the unity we have in the family. God designed the family. He designed, he designed it for fellowship. That is, intimate fellowship between one man and one woman. Thereby creating a good environment to raise godly children. And this fellowship together must continue so that each one in the family, the husband to the wife, the wife to the husband, the parents to the children, the children to the parents, each one will be the best he or she can so that the family will be what it ought to be. I'm going to uh, do some things tonight. I'm going to give you some words. And I give you these words to help you to remember. You take the word family, the F, I talk about fellowship. The A, I talk about acceptance. The M, I talk about maturity. I, integrity. L, love. Y, yieldedness. If we are going to really be happy in the family, there is uh, going to be real fellowship among us. And in fellowship, we have communion. We are communicating together. We are talking together. We are sharing together. We are being in partners together. It means we're harmoniously sharing our lives together and we're moving in the same direction. And in that kind of fellowship and harmony, there will be times we'll need to forgive one another. There will be times we'll need to forbear with one another. All that is part of the fellowship in the family. But we're not going to be able to do that except there is acceptance of one another. If the wife is trying by all means to change the husband in one night, in one week, to become the kind of ideal man that she wants, you're not going to be able to have fellowship in that way. And if the husband is always criticizing everything, you must be like this, you must talk like this, you must do everything like this, and you do not accept her the way she is, and then depending upon the Lord, upon the grace of the Lord, for the Lord to work on her. Give her time so that you accept her now as she is and do not allow anything you don't appreciate to bring discord among you acceptance of one another you'll see that our children too when they are growing up you'll find some awkwardness when they're growing up because they're little children and you parents have grown up you have grown up physically you have grown up emotionally and you have grown up in many areas of your life and these children are just getting up and growing going through the trials and the conflicts and the problems you have already gone through and you have overcome you are going to accept those children the way they are it is from that point of acceptance you'll be able to move on now to what you want in their lives and you children if we're going to have acceptor, if we're going to have real fellowship in the family, you're going to accept your parents the way they are. And then you'll be secretly praying for them that God will make them the kind of the ideal father. 
that you picture in your mind the kind of the ideal mother you picture in your mind if we are going to have a united family there's going to be acceptance of one another and then you know we're going to have maturity it's maturity that tells you that shows you how to act to one another it's maturity that tells you it's not everything you see you talk about it's maturity that makes you to know it's not everything you don't agree with that you talk about it's maturity that makes you to know there is the right time to say the right thing to the right person in the right place because you see between husband and wife you may just be saying the right thing to your wife and you have the right to do that but you may be doing that in the wrong place in the front of the children or in the presence of everybody else it is maturity that tells you that makes you to know in our relationship interaction in the family i know that i need to say the right thing that's not enough i'm saying that right thing to the right person that's not enough i'm saying it at the right time when he or she is disposed to listening to me i'm saying it in the right place you see we grow in a level of maturity then you are going to have integrity there's no way you can really raise up a family there's no way you can really have a good family without having integrity you have to be faithful you have to know some principles have some convictions and because of the integrity you have you just know i cannot go outside that boundary i cannot say that thing i cannot do that i have committed myself to this woman and whether she is there or she is not there integrity demands this is the way i will have to act and because of my commitment because of my promise because of the marriage covenant we have gotten into this is just the right thing to do the same thing with the wife you have to have that integrity of course everything centers around love can we have a family without love can you spell family without an l can you enjoy real family fellowship without the love of God in your heart? I'll be talking more about that later. Then there is yieldedness. Uh, you know what I find? You find among the motorists, uh, you know, in town. I hope you don't do that. You find, um, you know, a motorist is coming and then you are also driving. And you find that you are on the right lane you find the other fellow is on the wrong lane and then you say look at this man coming in front of me and then you look at everything remember all the codes of driving that you have you say I am right he is wrong the problem is he doesn't know he's wrong the problem is he's coming your direction he is on the wrong lane and is coming right on he is not lessening his speed and you say i am going to hold on to my right and i know i'm right i'm going to continue the speed i'm on i checked all i've checked all the laws of the land i've checked the code of driving i know that i am 100 percent right you know you are right but your being right may land you in the mortuary you know yieldedness yield to him you know he is wrong you don't want to die you don't want him to collide with you therefore get apart and let him pass that doesn't cost you anything you know in the family there are times you are right but later you become dead right everything now is dead because i am right she is wrong she doesn't know she is wrong i'm holding on to what i know to be right obviously she is wrong and i can give her seven scripture references why she is wrong ephesians chapter 5 wives submit to your husbands and i know she has she is not submitting to me i quote another one you must submit as the church is submitting to christ and i know she is failing in that area my friend you can quote all the scriptures and you are right but you'll be dead right by the time you finish all those references your family has collapsed because you are right 
and you cannot yield there is a point of yieldedness in the family where you don't always claim your right where you don't always stand and say i know i'm right i know he is wrong i know she is wrong and because of that now you scatter everything brothers and sisters in our families let there be fellowship if there's going to be fellowship we'll need forbearance we'll need forgiving one another we'll need acceptance of one another we'll need some level of maturity we'll need integrity we'll need love we'll need yieldedness yieldedness to god yieldedness to the word of god yieldedness to one another family life is a life of commitment the uncommitted and irresponsible man cannot raise up a godly family and the uncommitted and irresponsible woman cannot raise up and maintain a good family we need a relationship of commitment first commitment to the lord and then commitment to one another and commitment to our children we need to underline that area sometimes we find that husband and wife are committed to one another and they, have don't, they don't have any problem on that area but they are not committed to the children if we are going to maintain a family understand that family life is a life of commitment commitment to the lord commitment to one another commitment to the children and the husband must be committed to patterning his life after the life of christ the wife must be committed to personal relationship with god having inner beauty as her priority always leaning upon the lord to draw strength and wisdom from the lord now both the father and the mother both the husband and the wife must be committed to loving their children leading them to salvation in christ helping them to develop into the person god wants them to be with active faith in christ and joyful service to the lord and we're going to deal with three points in the message number one the power that sustains power that sustains number two problems demanding solution problems demanding solution number three principles of training children number one power that sustains in the family number two problems demanding solution in the family number three principles of training children in the family number one the power that sustains us within the family in ephesians chapter 5 ephesians 5 reading from verse 2 and walk in love as christ also has loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to god for a sweet smelling savor I know that this uh, reference of scripture is a general kind of scripture but then you understand the scripture that is meant for everybody is meant for every individual and the scripture that is meant for every individual is also meant for the family and as we bring this in application to the family you walk in love as christ also has loved you you measure the level of your love there are times that it may be that your own parents will tell you that uh -uh, this love is too much you can't uh, go out without her you can't eat without her you can't take decision without her you can't do anything without her what kind of thing is this this love is too much and then you begin to think to you that isn't this true am i not giving too much to this woman or it is the woman am i not giving too much to the man then you come back to the scripture the power that holds the family the power that sustains the family is love and it is the kind of love that jesus manifested walk in love what kind of love what level of love 
as Christ also has loved us. How did he demonstrate that love? He gave himself for us as an offering. Therefore, you understand, it's a giving kind of love in the family. You are eager to give. You are not being forced to give. Your husband is not forcing you to give. And it is not after a lot of argument, after a lot of discussion, that the husband is giving to the wife. Even before she says anything, even before the children demand anything, we think ahead. We think of the need of the family. And because of the love that sustains in the family, we give and give and give. And it says, a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. And in chapter 5, that same chapter 5, reading from verse 25, husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church. Even as. Make sure that all the time you are measuring your love with the love of Christ. If any suggestion comes to your mind, I think this woman wants to take me for granted. Because I'm always smiling, because I'm always saying, uh, yes, my dear, yes, honey, or yes, dear, or yes, so-and-so. And because I'm always, oh, praise the Lord, everything is all right. And because of the kind of attitude I have, she wants to take me for granted. I think I need to screw up a little. Then remember, husbands, love your wives, even us. As my daddy loved my mommy. Uh-huh. That's how some of... I, my mommy will never do that to my daddy and my daddy will never have taken that from my mommy i know that therefore i know i'm going too far with this woman i'm loving her too much let me go back to the example i saw at home when i was young if that example you saw at home is less than the love of christ for the church abandon that thing and follow the love of christ that's the standard by which we are to love our wives that he gave himself for the church in verse 28 so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies you will not stab yourself you cannot stab your wife you will not disrespect yourself dishonor yourself accuse yourself criticize yourself even when you know your fault i'm sure that everyone here you know areas where you are telling the lord privately and uh, you are saying oh lord i know i need to correct that area i need to correct that area you know things that are wrong that needs to be corrected about yourself do you write it in the newspapers do you broadcast it over the radio do you broadcast it over the television do you come to church on sunday morning and say everybody uh, listen i'm a christian i'm born again but i'm so ashamed of myself i'm such a terrible christian although i'm not living in open sin if i told you how bad my life is every one of you will be weeping for me <laughs> do you do that no you won't do that in fact if i knew about it uh, you'll be saying uh, pastor uh, that thing you know i've changed everything is different now you'll be covering it up before we talk about it how are you then exposing the fault of your wife you will love your wife as you love yourself wives the same thing you will love your husband too like you love yourself it is that love that is the power in the family that sustains the family now you've heard of ten commandments but listen up i'm going to give you in scripture ten commandments that are related to love love within the family and as you think about the power that sustains us in the family you are thinking about these ten commandments i'm going to give you ten commandments that are stated positively on the one hand and then ten commandments that are stated negatively although they are stated negatively because they have the word not yet they relate to love in the family and if we always remember this we're going to love one another and we're going to have the power the power of love that sustains the family number one care one for another that's the love your wife is sick take extra time stay with her give her some attention take care of her even things she could do for herself you'll just say no i'll do that i'll boil the water i'll wash those clothes 
I'll clean those things up. Don't worry about those plates. I'll get her. I'll take care of them. Care one for another. Is she pregnant and therefore she is weak? Physically, care for her at such a time. And is your child sick and she needs extra attention? Care for that child with that extra attention at that time. Is your husband sick or downcast? He needs extra care at that time. Care one for another. When we just say, yes, I love her. Yes, I love him. It is the every is a practical thing we do to our wife, to our husband that shows that we love one another. And then in caring, there are times you will surprise your wife. She is uh, not expecting you'll buy anything for her. And of course, I know that you are born again uh, Christians. And you know how we hide some of our uh, stinginess under the fact that I am born again you know i'm so born again all these people that are not born again they are the people that buy new clothes at christmas time praise the lord but now i am born again i don't buy clothes at christmas for anybody but i buy for myself and uh, you know all these unbelievers that people that go to church uh, two times in a year they go at easter time and they go at christmas time and you will see them they will uh, they'll be killing uh, you know whether fowl or whatever it is and they are eating jollof rice uh, you know easter time but praise the lord i'm born again now all those things do not matter to me but you go to a restaurant and eat jollof rice you don't want to do it for your wife you don't want to do it for anybody else but you do it for yourself care for one another and show something and do something that this person will say things are changing my husband is manifesting more love my wife is showing more care number two forgive and be kind to one another the first one is in first corinthians chapter 12 verse 25 the second one, which is forgive and be kind one to another, is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Forgive and be kind one to another. You see, it, before you do anything, am I saying what I want to say because of what he did yesterday that I didn't appreciate? Have I forgiven him? Have I forgiven her? What I want to do now, am I doing it indirectly to revenge? Or is it cleaned off? cleansed off from a memory and it is not part of what informs my action now forgive one another and be kind one to another number three is in romans chapter 12 verse 10 write it down honor one another honor one another uh, you know there are people that have the idea that uh, men should be honored by the women but never the other way around they feel that our wives ought to honor us they ought to respect us they ought to speak nicely to us but we we are men and we don't have to respect them we don't have to honor them now it goes both ways you honor your wife your wife honors you in fact we're told in honor preferring one another even the people of the world who don't have uh, the experience of being born again but they have got some principles that have been affected by the principles of scriptures they will say ladies first now you do that in your office you are going in and uh, you know a lady wants to get inside the gate you then you stop you say ladies first you allow her to pass the problem i have with you is you come back home and you never remember ladies first you eat all the meat in the pot you drink all the tea there is to drink everything good in the house to take everything and your wife says what am i going to have manage yourself now ladies first honor one another it is that attitude of honoring one another that will help us to maintain a good family number four serve one another galatians chapter 5 verse 13 serve one another do you ever serve your wife in little things in big things can you serve her in public can you serve her in private can you serve and do something for her just just service just service serving her serve one another now you say i'm not talking about the wife the wife is always serving the husband you know that in our culture 
The problem is the husband coming up now with the grace of God in his life being able to serve. Then, number five, consider one another. That's Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. Consider one another. Number six, bear one another's burdens. Galatians 6, 2. Bear one another's burden. And then number seven, have compassion one on another. Be compassionate. Compassion will affect your language. It will affect even the look on your face when you are at home. Compassion will affect the way you, the, the pronunciation of the words in, at home. Because you see, there are ways of talking. When you have compassion, when you have mercy, when you have love, that compassion, that love will be reflected in the tone of your language. And then number eight, edify one another. You said, but how about the reference for her compassion on one another? That's why I told you before, not today and not at this time, by concordance. Do you have concordance? Okay, whichever one I do not give you, you'll go back and check up in your concordance. Uh, but for the sake of those who may not get that concordance this week, First Peter chapter 3, and in verse 8, First Peter 3 verse 8. Now, edify one another. Edify one another. First Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 11. Submit one to the other. Ephesians 5 21. And pray one for another. Pray one for another. It will surprise you to find husbands that will not pray for the wife. My husband, I don't understand this uh, sickness that I have. You're always sick. That's what we are saying. You have not developed your faith. Every time I'm sick, I'm sick, I'm sick. My brother, but you pray for other people in the church. You pray for the people that say they are sick. They came before, they came before, they came before. And they are coming now. And you still pray for them. Pray for your wife. And then it may be you, the wife that has developed your faith. You pray for your husband as well. Is there any particular peculiar weakness in the life of that man, in the life of that wife, in the lives of those children? You will pray one for the other. And our children too. Here is where our children miss it. They feel that, well, it's daddy. And therefore he knows all things. He can do all things. Everything is okay with daddy. And it's mommy. Mommy, it's all right. She knows the scripture. She's been born again before we were born into the world. And when daddy or mommy has any problem, the children will not know. They too, they should pray for the parents. We pray for our children. Our children pray for us. Husband prays for wife. And wife pray for husband. That is how we can maintain the love in the family. I told you that there are ten commandments too that are stated negatively. Let's look at them. Number one please not yourself that's our problem in the family i want to please myself you want to please yourself the children want to please themselves and we go in different directions but you see if we love one another it says please not yourself romans 15 1 number two defraud ye not one the other defraud ye not one the other what that is saying is there are some things of the man that actually the man possesses that the wife needs. You are adults, and I, when I say that way, you ought to understand. There are things that the wife possesses that belongs, that belongs to her, but will be for the good of the husband. Therefore, defraud ye not one another. Of course, there are things that the parents possess, and they are for the good of the children. Defraud ye not one another. Don't say, it's mine, it's mine, it's mine. It's not yours. It belongs to the family. The moment you got married, nothing that you have belongs to you alone like a bachelor. It belongs to the whole family. Don't touch that. Don't drink of that cup. Don't go that direction. That's my thing. Don't uh, use nothing. You can't do that anymore. You will not defraud one another. You will not cheat one another or deprive one another of what is in your hand, what's in your possession, which is for the good and for the pleasure of the other one. Number three, grudge not against one another. That's in James chapter 5 verse 9. 
grudge not against one another. And uh, in number four, judge not, condemn not. Luke chapter 6, verse 37. Judge not, condemn not. Number five, be not bitter. Be not bitter against your wife. And you, wife, don't be bitter against the husband. You understand? Uh, families will live together. Husband and wife are living together. And because you are living together, once in a while you'll see some things you don't approve of. You'll see some things you don't fully appreciate. You will not be bearing grudge because of that. You will not be bitter because of that. There should be a constant melting that erases all those things you don't appreciate every moment and every day. Number six, speak uh, the other one is Colossians 3.19. Speak not evil one of another. Speak not evil one of another. Your children will never hear you speak any bad thing about your husband. It may even be things that are very, very obvious. That even the children themselves, as they are growing up, they've seen that, that uh, their father has that peculiarity. As that uh, maybe deformity or as that whatever it is you will never open your mouth and talk to the children and mention not even in person never the same thing the husband uh, looking at the wife there may be a peculiar thing about the wife even the children as they are growing up they may see that well it appears that that's a weakness on the side of mommy that we're praying about but you will never talk about it not even in person not a slight comment about it you will not speak evil one of another whether she's there or she's not there whether he is there or he is not there the only person you can speak to will be speaking to the lord and if god gives you the wisdom and the love and the method of passing it across you speak to the person himself my husband i think uh, i count this as my problem too we're going to take it to the lord in prayer together my wife, I think uh, this is it's a challenge to me. I know it embarrasses you. I wouldn't say it embarrasses me, but I think I'm going to take the challenge this new year and take this problem as my problem, and I'm going to get on my knees and do everything possible. The problem will be removed. And so you will not be speaking evil of one another. And then uh, number seven, revenge not revenge not i'm not here to teach you how to revenge but you already you know there are husbands they have their way of revenging he she denied me of that all right if i cannot help you that's all right but i know i'm waiting for her she is going to demand this other thing from me and when she comes then i will remind her uh -huh. you know how to demand something from another person when it comes to your turn now you'll be saying no i am sick no i am weak no i don't have time now here we are now until you two you can bend and give me what i want don't come and ask me for that kind of thing don't revenge isn't that revenge she did that to me i'll do it back to her he did that to me i will do it back to him revenge not now number eight revenge not is in uh, romans chapter 12 verses 17 to 21 number eight may surprise you that i'm going to quote this kind of reference for a believer and it's in uh, uh, proverbs chapter 26 and verse 4 and maybe you have never seen the reference, so I'm going to open it and read it to you. Proverbs chapter 26 and in verse 4. If you get there before me, don't read it because you may start laughing if you read it. In Proverbs chapter 26 and in verse 4, it says, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him somebody is laughing already <laughs> now you know we should tell ourselves this sometimes we are wise like university professors outside but when we come back home there are times the husband wise as a professor outside he may say something foolish he shouldn't have said at that time understand that's not his normal character that is accidental 
just look, you wives, when a, an husband says something like that, and say, that's a foolish thing. How could you say that? Don't reply. Answer not a fool according to his folly. Just smile and say, oh, is that so? Can that be true? Is that really the whole truth and the absolute truth about that thing? Well, the Lord knows the best. Then go to another topic. Answer not a fool according to his folly. And sometimes it is, uh, you know, it is the wife that uh, is uh, saying uh, something. And you know, normally she is wise. Normally she is intelligent. And she doesn't say this kind of thing every time. But because of the pressure and because of the depression and because of the peculiarity of that time, maybe just discouraged, fed up, then she says something, and uh, you know that she shouldn't have said that. That's like a foolish uh, kind of statement. Don't say you are a fool. You can never say that. You just say, uh, look at her and say, I'm trying to understand. I think the Holy Spirit will help me to understand everything. I'm learning every day. And what you have said now, maybe I will learn the significance and the meaning of that before tomorrow morning. Then you smile, go to another subject. And do not stay on that thing. If we're going to maintain love in the family, answer not a fool according to his folly. Number nine, follow not that which is evil. You see the examples of other people. You see the way they are running their families. Follow not that which is evil. That's in 3 John verse 11. Number 10, provoke not to wrath. Don't provoke your children to wrath. Don't provoke your parents to wrath. And do not provoke the wife to wrath. And do not provoke the husband to wrath. We're in the family. And you know there is a kind of thing, whenever you say it, the wife feels offended. You've learned by our living together, she just doesn't like that kind of language, that kind of comment. Avoid it totally. Remove it away from your vocabulary. Never say that thing that will provoke your wife or provoke your husband or provoke your children to rose. You know, for example, maybe your child has a particular peculiarity. In your own way, you are trying to correct that child. You don't want that child to behave in that awkward manner. And then you have a way of saying it. You will say it, and that thing is acidic, the way you say it. It's cutting. It burns, the way you say it. It gets into the brain, into the mind, disorganizes that child, the way you say it. When you realize that the way you are saying that thing to that child is not helping the child, although you are trying to correct something, you will not say it that way again. You'll find a better way, a loving way, that will still say it in a corrective manner, but that will not provoke that child to wrath. Well, before I leave point number one, you know that the Bible says very clearly that once we, are, we have got married, we are joined together. I want you to now follow through on that word, joined together, that you'll find in Matthew chapter 19, verse 6. Husband and wife joined together. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and be joined together with his wife. They are no more twain, but they are one. What's the implication of being joined together? It means we dwell together too. If you are joined together, dwell together. That's um, Psalm 133, verses 1 to 3. It means to grow together. You grow together. You start your life together. Then you are growing together. It means also you walk together. And two cannot walk together except they be agreed. And it means you are inheriting together. You are inheriting eternal things, spiritual things together. Let's make sure that we have been joined together. And then as a result of being joined together, we're dwelling together. We're worshipping together. And we're doing everything together. Actually, we do not have a mind of, I'll keep my things to myself. You will keep your things to yourself. We live together, dwell together, walk together, inherit together, do everything together. In uh, Psalm 133, behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. But what hinders us from dwelling together, dwelling together in unity? That leads me to point number two. Problems demanding solution in the family. And here is uh, the place we have to be factual. We're among ourselves. 
were believers here and many of us are married and you know the problems we have in our families we need to identify these problems and then we need to see what solution the word of god has for them i do not have too much time in my favor because of that i'll just run through first part of the problems relating to the wife wife just uh, you know keep cool uh, don't get angry as i run through this one belonging to you i'm doing that for you first so that i'll treat the one for your husband later so i can get their attention because if i talk about them first they're not going to listen to the rest of what i'm saying now uh, you wives are you ready now you see the problems we have we transfer our domestic duties to maids you remember it's not the maid that married the man and the maid is there to help you not to take over from you when last did your husband eat the food you actually cooked yourself is it the maid that now does everything the inability to keep the maid in her place allowing the maid because of our laziness and carelessness to take over almost completely it ruins the family therefore take your place and put the maid and the helpers in their place number two too much attachment to the mother that is your mother who raised you up before you got married you are still so much attached to her and to your own family members that sometimes you'll even be spending for yourself and spending for members of your extended family without even informing your husband that hurts your husband will not appreciate that and the lord does not appreciate it either number three apathy towards the husband apathy towards your personal appearance you know sometimes you'll see a beloved sister she is normally nice and god has created her beautiful and you know she is actually neat and wonderful when there is a special occasion if we were going to have ifl program international friendship league see our wives and see how they clean up and they make their hair do and they dress very well and they go to the uh, they go to the function and then the husbands will be wondering uh -uh. so my wife can be this neat so my wife can be this well dressed but when we get back home that kind of neatness is no more there we feel oh well, he is my husband and he knows me very well and therefore uh, the clothes that already has the odor and the smell of onion and pepper and the stain of oil and everything we just we just uh, you know have it on us and come to the bedroom and get everywhere and then we say my dear uh, this kind of dressing can we change it oh, what's the matter is are we not in the house are we going to church is it only when we're going to church we dress well look nice to your husband amen, amen. that's part of it don't be apathetic towards your personal appearance together with your husband or towards spiritual things dirty home environment inability to tidy up the house and to prepare good meals that the husband and the children will really enjoy eating you see that's apathy we just do things in a nonchalant way and we do not care we're doing something for somebody that's important and significant in our lives or it is carelessness or it is not making yourself uh, you know talk well and do things uh, right with your husband now let's remove that kind of carelessness and apathy and look the best way you can to your husband i don't mean worldliness there is a world of difference between neatness and worldliness isn't that so our sisters did you get the message okay i hear your voice now you're still there now number four resentment 
against something you don't appreciate in the man. Resentment that leads to carelessness and casualness in your relationship. It just become careless and casual. Because there's something you don't appreciate in the man, and you've been thinking that he will change it, and he has not changed it. Number five, loneliness and self-pity. You feel lonely. And it may be something that the husband ought to correct because it's due to separation or isolation. And it may be due to lack of involvement with the husband's life and with the interests of the husband. Not having enough time with the husband to share on family matters and to plan for the family. But instead of looking at the problem and seeing how you want to address the problem, you just uh, say, well, he doesn't have time for me. He doesn't know that he's a married man. I don't know why he even got married. And then you get all ruffled and you are not thinking how you can bring a positive solution to that problem of loneliness. It's not self-pity that will solve the problem. Then number six is lack of control on the tongue. Lack of control on the tongue. Complaining, criticizing, being moody, angry, tense talk, not making the home a place of joy and rest. There may be more problems, but those are some of the problems from our wives' sides that I'm believing the Lord, the Lord will give you the grace to portray. Now, the men, are the men still there? In body and in spirit? Yes. That is, you are totally there. Yes. Do you want me to talk about the problems? Yes. Or do I... Tomorrow we'll go to halls 8, 9, and 10. And in between us, we'll share it together where these are wives will not hear about it. Praise the Lord! All right, I think uh, the women would like me to talk about it. Now, problems with, with me. Problems with us who are men, all of us together now. Nobody exempted. Are you convenient now? Now, number one is the lack of love. We are harsh. We rule the home like soldiers rule their barracks. We command. And we tell them what to do. We don't give any reason. They must do it. Obey. Obey first. Never complain. You see, when we act like a dictator in the home, it doesn't help our family. Let's change our language. Let's change our manner. Let's change the approach. Let's be soft. Let's be loving at home. Number two, selfishness in spending. Spending to satisfy greed rather than need. We spend on ourselves. And we do not allow the wife to have access to what we call the joint account. It is no more a joint account. The wife is putting everything she has into that account. The husband is putting everything he has into that account. And yet, the wife does not know how the money is being spent. In fact, she is not a signatory to that account. And she cannot go to the bank in our absence and collect what the family needs. That's not right. If it is a joint account, let it be a joint account. I would not like to say that uh, maybe if you cannot keep a joint account, let the man have his own account, let the woman have her own account. Because if I said that, that is like saying we cannot solve the problem, but we can solve the problem. And we will solve the problem. But we shouldn't make the joint account something now that punishes the woman. If she brings her money, you bring your money, we have the joint account, each of you should have equal access to that account so that she will be able to spend everything that is needed for herself, for you and for the family and for the children. 
And sometimes the problem of false men is that we keep another secret account apart from the joint account. And the only thing the wife knows about is the joint account. But there's another account that you will go and draw from and the wife doesn't know anything about that. That is unchristianly. That is selfishness. And that's thing ought to be corrected in our lives. Then number three, unwillingness to leave the father and mother and the family members and to cleave to your wife. Cleave to your wife. Remain with your wife. We have the problem of neglecting our wives for our friends. It's like uh, you have more attachment to your friends than you have to your wife. You have more interest in your friends than you have in your wife. Or it may be your profession that is taking your time. You have more attachment and commitment to that business or to that profession more than you have to your wife. That must be corrected and will be corrected by the grace of God. Supporting and spending for extended family members while we are neglecting the relations of our own wife. All the money we have, if there is any extra, we are spending on our own extended family. They are always coming. My uncle, my cousin, my brother, everybody, even those who are not related to us, once we are rich, we are their brothers. And they are coming and coming. And the realities, the relations of your wife, do not have that opportunity to come to your wife and get anything. And it is her money and your money you are spending on your own people. Now that's not a Christian attitude. Number four, lack of communication. Failure to talk. There are times there's just a blackout in the family. The husband won't talk. The wife won't talk. Everything is quiet. And we're avoiding one another. She walks this way. And he walks that way. If the wife was singing choruses before the man came in, once the man comes in, the woman will stop singing choruses. If anybody was laughing, jumping, rejoicing before the man came in, once the man came in, what's making everybody happy there? Children, no books to read. Wife, no clothes to watch. Every day is Christmas Day. All this noise of singing, let it stop. Now, all that must change in Jesus' name. We must care for one another. Talk to one another. Now, why don't we talk to one another? Because I'm assuming she is not interested in that subject. I'm assuming he, my husband, will not understand if I raise that thing up. Because of that, there is now it degenerates into deliberately hiding information from one another. We are hiding information from one another. In fact, outsiders know much about the man that the wife knows. That will not be right. Number five, care, a, a lack of care and attention. No respect, no love, no concern for the wife. And uh, when the wife is pregnant, I think uh, it will be good if we men will sometimes read books on pregnancy. You say, are we carrying children? No, so that you will appreciate what your wife goes through when she is pregnant. In some parts of the world, when the woman is about to deliver in labor pains, they'll bring the husband in. They'll say, man, stay here. See everything that is going on. And then you see the pain. You see the labor. And then when she's delivering, that makes you to appreciate that woman better. That makes you to love the child that is born better. Because, you know, that mother, your wife, went through something to bring that child to this world. But you see, many times, we're not concerned. She's having pain, she's sick, or she's weak, or anything is going on. We don't understand. It, we must have attention and care when our wives are sick. Or maybe they are not sick physically. They have some problems that we need to look into. Number six, lack of appreciation. She never does anything well. Always we're criticizing. Every time we are finding fault. There is no understanding that the wife is a weaker vessel. That she can be tired. That she can be discouraged. That she can be depressed. 
and that uh, if uh, she is too much under strain and stress, it may affect her mind, it may affect her brain. Therefore, you will take care of her. I'm going to ask you, when last did you stay in the hot kitchen and cooked a meal as a man? You think? And you say, I've forgotten since I got married. When last did you sit down and then with ordinary soap and uh, water wash the clothes? You say, oh, since I got married, she's there. Once she's there, why should I do that? But you realize she does all that. She walks up and down. If you calculate the kilometers that the average woman moves, walks in a day, just going from kitchen to this place to that place, just going up and down, going up and down, you are always in the vehicle. From vehicle, you sit in a sitting room. You cannot even rise up to turn on the AC yourself. Marianne, are you there? Come and uh, turn on that AC for me. And then you put your feet uh, there up, you relax, and then you are reading the newspapers. Marianne, how long is it going to take you for this meal to be ready? I'm sorry, I'm uh, hurrying up, I'm hurrying up. All right, before you finish, uh, turn on this. I say, AC is uh, becoming too cold for me. Can I have a cup of cold water to drink there? And, uh, you know, the woman is just walking up and down, walking up and down. And you never realize that she is tired. And the problem is, you will never buy a washing machine to wash the clothes. And you will not buy the things that will make it easy for that woman to be able to do the work she has to do in the house. And then after you have finished in the night, you have eaten, she is back in the kitchen washing things, taking care of this, putting this all right, putting this all right. For one hour, two hours, after you have finished your meal, she is still busy. She is the one to get up in the morning. And she's the one to uh, sleep uh, the latest in the family. She's the one that does everything. We never say thank you. You know, the woman brings the food on the table. You look at it and uh, you say, is this all? And then you, you eat. You won't even wait for her so you can eat together. What kind of Christian are you? Saved. Don't let them hear. If we are children of God things must change. We must make sure that this kind of criticism and fault finding, it stops in our family and it will stop in Jesus' name. Number seven, callousness in attitude. Preventing the husband from listening or responding to the wife's needs. They, oh, you must understand, women don't talk the way men talk. Women don't say what they have in mind the way men will say what they have in mind. In fact, even if they wanted to do that, they do not have the chance to talk the way we talk. Therefore, you may find that uh, your wife is talking a particular way. No, please, if you want to talk, talk. This kind of uh, emotional uh, kind of talk, I don't want at all. You have not studied, women are emotional. And when you married a woman, you married emotion. And therefore, when she talks in her own way, please don't complain again. I don't like the way you are talking. That's the way God made her. Let her express herself. Give her freedom. Listen to her. Show that you are paying attention. Show that she is significant and she is important and she is a person that is worthy of being listened to. When you listen to her, even if you don't do anything, if you are not even able to solve the problem, just listening and smiling and nodding your head and saying now i understand oh i'm sorry i didn't understand this all along see how long it has taken me we have married for five years now and see how a dull i am i am just understanding this for the first time the woman is satisfied even if you don't solve that problem you mean you understand now you mean everything is all right now what can i cook for you how can I just make you happy? What I'm telling you is, women like to be listened to. Give time, create time, and listen to your wife, and you'll find that your family will change. External influence from in-laws and so-called friends must not be allowed to affect our attitude to 
our wives, number eight, no active role in the training and the spiritual upbringing of the children. That gives problem to our wives. We leave everything to them. It's like, uh, read the Bible to the children. That's, that's your area. Teach uh, the children how to pray. That's your area. Teach the children the songs that they need to sing. That's your area. Um, look over with them in their chemistry, English, literature, whatever they have to learn. Look into their school, work with them. That should be your area. We leave everything for the upbringing of the children. We leave everything to the mother. And that is not right. Everything weighs too much on the woman. And the woman is carrying greater load than the man is carrying. And she is the weaker vessel. It's the weaker vessel that is carrying the heavier load. It's a stronger man that is carrying the lighter load. It shouldn't be like that. We should reverse it and change things around. Then number nine, this is serious. Joblessness. But it's not just, just joblessness alone. It is joblessness and no serious effort to be gainfully employed. You are jobless. Your wife is working. It's your wife that is paying the house rent, providing for the family, and you are not even making any serious effort at all to be able to provide for the family. And she's carrying the burden and the responsibilities of raising a home alone. That does not help. Then number 10, making delay in child bearing an unpardonable sin of the wife. What I mean is this, you have married and now there is delay in child bearing. You have not gone to check up in the hospital whether the fault is your fault biologically or whether the fault is her fault biologically. But because there is a little delay in child bearing, every conversation we have in the family terminates with, eh, oh, you know how to talk. Eddie, you need this, you need this. When are you going to give us a baby in the family? And then we finish that, and we're talking about another thing. Ah, it was uh, wonderful today. You know, we went to church, and it, the, the service was beautiful. Everything was so nice. But the reply of the husband, eh, it was so nice. Didn't you see Sister So-and-so carrying her baby? Didn't you see Sister So-and-so carrying her baby? Every conversation we have terminates with, where is the child? Is she the one to create a baby? Is she the one? Doesn't she want a baby? She wants a baby. And it may even be your fault biologically. Therefore, it is something we leave in the hands of God. We're going to pray about. And when we pray about it, I believe that God will change everything in Jesus' name. Well, I've talked about uh, the problems. Uh, there are solutions. Praise the Lord. And the Lord himself gives us solution. The solution is, number one, love one another. And know that because we're redeemed, we can have sacrificing love for one another. And we can have serving love. In love, serving one another. We give ourselves. We give our time. We give our energy. We give our finances to serve our wives. And also we, the wives, we give everything we have to serve the husband. And of course, whatever we have is for the children too. We are to make sure that we help, we serve our children. Instead of putting a great load on the shoulders of the woman, our love will always be seeking ways of lifting up the load that she is carrying. We may sometimes need to even stay with the children to allow her to participate in a special program. Here is what I have in mind. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, we, we, we have a lot of privileges and opportunities as men. And, uh, you know, I want to go to an evening meeting. I go and she has to take care of the children. I want to go to a particular place, travel somewhere. I go and she has to stay back and take care of the children. Every time the husband takes all the privilege for himself. But when the wife now is thinking of uh, my husband... Uh, we have women fellowship tonight, uh, tonight, uh, Friday. We need to go for women uh, fellowship. Oh, the first question is, what are you going to leave the children with? My brother, you are there. They are your children. 
you will be besieged when the woman is going for the women conference that is part of what you will do do you know how to be besieged if you don't know start doing it you see how the men are quiet now will you do it all right women when you come back next time tell me let me know what's going on now we must be able to help our wives and lift some of the load away from them sometimes there is a women conference they have to come for the headquarters here and they will say please say, leave your children at home and then the husband will say my wife you want to go for that conference remember the children but you are there you are not coming for the women program you will stay with those children at home take care of them how will they eat the kitchen is there go there how will they be clothed the clothes are there they put it on the children you must know how to take care of the children in the absence of the woman so that the woman will be free at least to be able to have some uh, breathing space maybe even when there is no conference at all when there is uh, no women fellowship at all and we just say can we take one day in a week and we tell the children we say children uh, our mommy has been working too hard and she's getting tired we're going to take one day off her and she, it's going to be a free day holiday and therefore you children daddy and children uh, will uh, do the cooking and do everything and every one of us were going to serve one mommy one day in the week after all she's serving us every time wouldn't it be wonderful a turning around of things if our families can now begin to think about lifting the load helping the women helping the wife so that life will become easier for the uh, wives and of course make finance available everything you have if you die you are not going to take those things away with you make that money available let the wife know everything there is to know while you are still there together i believe that as these things are corrected by the grace of god things will change in a wonderful way in our families in jesus name let me very quickly go to point number three our time is gone already it is the principle of training children in the family there's a familiar passage that you yourself that you know in uh, proverbs chapter 22 and verse 6 proverbs 22 verse 6 train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old he will not depart from it let us make sure that we train our children it will mean from the earliest age you see these children as the gift of god to the family and as a gift of god to the family you want to take care of this gift because their souls belong to god all souls are mine and he has commanded us to teach them and to lead them to salvation if they perish through our negligence then god will require their blood at our hands the question to you is are your children born again do they know the lord do they love the lord are they serving the lord do they appreciate the scriptures you will teach and train your children uh, to begin to serve the lord and to begin to uh, love the lord from the earliest age possible read for yourself later isaiah chapter 28 verses 9 and 10 how do we what do we teach them let me just give you some brief outline number one inculcate an early reverence for god in the minds of those children when they are still very very young in fact before they even understand language fully you will inculcate in them reverence for god number two teach them from an early age the value of the scriptures take care of the bible take care of scriptures and teach them the value of the scriptures let them know that the bible is the word of god and that it is the best book in the world number three reveal the love of god in christ to them and tell them that jesus died to provide salvation for all who repent and believe prayerfully influence them to love jesus when you are telling a child you want a child very very young to become born again 
to give his life to the Lord. You cannot do it the way adults uh, will respond to the gospel. There is a limit to the understanding of that little child. And you will not make that child to, uh, you know, talk about a sin and all the details and everything. Of course, if things are wrong, that that child that has got to the age of accountability can understand, you'll say, this is wrong. Jesus doesn't love that. He loves us. He doesn't love those bad things that we do. Telling lies and this and this and that. Make it very, very simple. And then you'll say, you'll tell the Lord that you know that the Lord does not love those things. You offended the Lord. You say, I'm sorry. I will not do that again. I know that you have taken my punishment away. You have taken the sin away because you died for me. In a way they can understand. Make those little children understand. But don't paint a bad picture. What I mean is, don't talk about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and give all the details of the crucifixion. Instead of that bringing faith in the heart of a child, it's going to scare that child. And don't talk about a hell when you know there is punishment, when your friend, your daddy will punish you because that thing, he doesn't like it. Our father in heaven too, he doesn't like it when we do something wrong. Therefore, he will punish us if we continue in those bad things. But don't give the details of hellfire. How the people were born for years and years. If you put one finger in the fire, you know how it hurts. Don't, don't say that. Because that child will be so scared, he will not know how to even believe. There are things that will be reserved for the mature age, for the child to understand. Reveal the love of God in Christ and show that child how Jesus died for him and how that child can love the Lord and give himself to the Lord. Number four, demonstrate before those children the practice of prayer. And let them develop the habit of praying when they are still young. Just make them understand, this is what daddy and mommy, this is what they do. And whenever any problem arises in the family, if it's any problem with the children, they have lost uh, something, or they are disappointed, or they failed a little test, whatever it is that they count a big problem, lead them to the Lord in prayer. Oh, say, we're going to take this problem to the Lord. Even if you have the solution, even if you know the solution to the problem, make them develop the habit of praying. You'll say, my child, this is why we're Christians, this is why we believe in the Lord, this is why we're in a Christian home. Every problem we have, we take it to the Lord in prayer. And that will help that child to develop the attitude of praying. Number five, set a good example before them. Live the Christian life before them. A single picture is worth more than a thousand words. What they see will influence them more than what you are saying. Therefore, set a good example before them. And live the Christian life before them so that they'll be able to follow. Children tend to become what their parents are. Number six, bring up your children in the habit of openness of conduct and truthfulness you tell your children you say children when i was young like you i did many things that i discovered later were not right so if you do something wrong it will not surprise me at all i don't want you to do something wrong but if you do it just tell me don't let me question you and question you and question you before you tell me oh daddy mommy i'm the one that did that thing if uh, something broke in the house like a glass like a plate before we ask you just come up and say daddy you know what happened today mommy you know what happened to i was careless and that thing was broken we may rebuke you we may tell you that it's not right you shouldn't have done that but we develop an attitude or a habit of openness let those children understand that you appreciate truthfulness that uh, whatever it is you appreciate them telling you the truth and uh, don't punish them for telling you the truth Make sure that uh, they understand being open is what the family appreciates. Number seven, encourage them to serve the Lord from their youth. Encourage them to serve the Lord from their youth. We've talked about many things uh, today, and we need the help of God in raising up a godly family, in having fellowship together. 
and having scriptural child training. But I believe that any help we need from the Lord in our families, the Lord will grant us that help. If we will only pray sincerely, our families can only be sustained by God's supernatural power if we will pray. There is no time now, what I would have said, maybe I should have done this uh, before I started the preaching, I would have said that husband and wife should get together now and then just for a minute or two talk together, forgive one another and let the past be totally past and then pray together, just there uh, together. And uh, if you are together, please, uh, you will do that. If you are not together, you will do it alone now. The wife will do it alone now. You know my case too. I'm here. And it will be strange to call my wife to the pulpit now and to share about the microphone. What did I do that you didn't appreciate? And then you'll be hearing, you know, we'll be washing our dirty clothes over the microphone. Well, we'll not do that. Uh, but, uh, you know, after this uh, message, I'll get back home and I, I would say, did you listen to that message? And uh, when you listen to that message, what was it you saw in the message? So oh, this man can talk, but tell me everything now privately and then we're going to settle everything together and we're going to talk about it. We're going to pray together. And that's what I want you to do. Uh, you are the husband or you are the wife there. After the message tonight and after we are prayed tonight, get time together and say, my husband, I'm sorry, I've seen the problem now. We're going to solve the problem. My wife, I was looking for you that you are going to forgive me this is going to be a new year. Our family is going to become different. Can we rise up and pray? Let's talk to the Lord to make our families better. Love one another. Let's stop all the criticism selfishness fault finding all those things that are not right let's remove them talk to the lord and after the meeting tonight you have a chance of seeing your wife you have a chance of